So yes, uh, today we are going to talk about a uh, lesser important from the pediatric point of view, but uh, definitely important from uh, a surgeon's point of view. So this is something that all of you use on your daily, uh, on your daily uh, operation theaters. And without further delay, we will talk about this. And this happens to be the use of tunicates. Okay, so <laughs> what is a tunicate basically? So tunicate is any device which is going to give you a, a bloodless field while operating. Okay, and this is generally very relevant to orthopedic surgeons because we operate on limbs of patients, which can easily be uh, occluded or the arterial supply of which can be occluded, thereby providing a bloodless field. Okay. Now, coming to the history to the use of tunique surgery. Now, as you know, the origins are linked to amputation surgery, where basically you tie one tight cloth above the level of amputation and one tight cloth below the level of amputation. Chop the, uh, the limb in between and you have a bloodless field where then you can hold the artery nerves and ligate them off. But this is back in the dark ages where the, uh, where the newer uh, techniques of amputation were not described then. Okay, and then... Uh, it was not until 1864 uh, that uh, Lister described the use of tunique for a procedure other than amputation. Okay, And Lister also pioneered the principle of exsanguination of limb, uh, exsanguination of the limb prior to uh, application of the tunique. Okay. Similarly, later down, about 10 years down the line, S. March, he described the use of a flat rubber bandage to exsanguinate the entire limb. However, he told to use it with caution in patients who are having an infection, such as a flexor tenosynovitis, etc. Okay. Then, oh, by the turn of the 20th century, uh, Harvey Cushing, he described what a pneumatic tourniquet was. Now, uh, what are the advantages of a pneumatic tourniquet? It was quick to inflate. Uh, you could monitor it with the, with the help of a manometer. Uh, it reduced the incidence of nerve palsies and it could be, uh, and it could be continuously monitored. Okay. And <laughs> of late, with all the uh, uh, the world wars as well as the higher military uh, presence, the use of emergency tunicates have also come into being. Now, emergency tunicate definitely is being used in military warfare, but even in uh, regular polytrauma patients where the limbs are exsanguinated, and most of our uh, general population as well as the geriatric population who have who are already on, are on some amount of anticoagulation. It could be aspirin, it could be clopidogrel or any of the newer methods of anticoagulation. These patients who are already on these drugs when they undergo a or when they uh, when they uh, come into a, a polytraumatic situation, the small wounds tend to bleed out very fast. And it is in those situations that tunique use has also emerged as a lifesaver or a limb saver in many conditions. Okay, so this is the history of the uh, of the use of tunique in orthopedic surgery. Now, coming to tunique use, how do you apply it nicely so that you can uh, use it effectively and without causing any complications? Okay, so uh, first of all, choosing the correct site of uh, of application is very important. Traditionally, the tunique is applied to the most proximal part of the operating limb where the muscle bulk is the greatest, and it also provides protection to the peripheral nerves. Okay, so uh, in general usage or traditional usage, it's going to be in the upper arm or in the upper thigh. Okay, but things have been changing with the advent of many subspecialties such as hand surgery, foot and ankle surgery. Nowadays, we also have, uh, say, ankle tunicase, calf tunicase, wrist tunicase. And these tunicates are applied at areas which are distal in position to the uh, in position to the traditionally applied sites. Okay, but remember, all the tunicates have to be applied proximal to the area of surgical field. Fine. Now, uh, it has been seen that uh, generally, when hand and uh, uh, hand and wrist surgery is performed, most of them are performing it either under regional block or under local anesthesia. And such uh, the low tunicates, that is wrist tunicates and uh, uh, calf tunicates or even uh, ankle tunicates 
help in reducing the pain of the tunique because they are applied well within the reg, uh, region of the anesthesia and post operative recovery is also fast okay but traditionally speaking it is in the proximal most part of the limb proximal thigh or the proximal arm next we need to choose the correct size of tunique now the length of the tunique should be appropriate to the size and circumference of the operated limb okay and ideally once the tourniquet is applied there should be an overlap of about 10 to 15 centimeters between the ends of the uh, velcro bandage so that it overlaps and you are able to uh, tie it more than one circle plus 10 centimeters okay another point of interest is to use the widest possible tourniquet without entering the surgical field. Okay, say you're operating a distal femur fracture for which you require a tourniquet to be applied. Now, uh, given the choice of tourniquet, it is always better that it, it, it might seem logical that you want, you want to use a smaller tourniquet so that you have more area for surgical field. But that is the wrong way of thinking. You need to put as wide a tourniquet as possible because that will help reduce the amount of pressure that is required to create a bloodless field. Now imagine you're using a 15 centimeter lower limb tourniquet on the proximal thigh. <laughs> okay. For a distal femur fracture, the amount of pressure that you require over here is going to be your systolic BP plus about 50 to 100 millimeters of mercury to create a bloodless field. However, if you are using a smaller uh, or a narrow tourniquet that is a 7 centimeter or a 10 centimeter tourniquet which is generally used for the upper limb then you might require you might be required to apply a tourniquet pressure which is about 150 to 200 more than the systolic blood pressure to create a bloodless field now that much amount of pressure is unnecessary and can lead to myonecrosis as well as nerve injuries Okay, so that is why it is important to understand that a wider cuff transmits a higher percentage of the tunique pressure to the deeper tissues. Okay, and once this uh, higher percentage of tunique pressure is transmitted, a lower overall cuff pressure is required. Okay, so that is why a wider tunique has been shown to be less painful and tolerated for a longer time to maintain the same level of blood vessel occlusion. Okay, now apart from the length and the width of the cuff you should also know that a curved tunique is ideal for a conical extremity such as the proximal thigh especially in patients with a larger habitus or else this can, could lead to slippage of the tourniquets using of paddings with tourniquets is another thing that we need to take care of now tourniquet padding is recommended because direct application of tourniquet on the skin can lead to skin abrasions and blister formations after the tourniquet is removed. Okay, so always apply padding, but apply only one to two layers of padding because the more the number of padding, layers of padding that are used, the lesser the amount of pressure that is transmitted through the padding. Okay, so use only one to two layers of padding. More the number of paddings, the tourniquet pressure which is required to create a bloodless field will be more. Okay, so just use one to two layers so that the <laughs> tourniquet is effective and the bloodless field is easy to obtain. However, remember when you're using padding, there is a risk of your sterile preparation going under the padding. Okay, especially alcohol-based solutions, even beta D. Okay, all of these while preparing the limb can go under uh, can go into the cast uh, into the uh, tourniquet padding okay and this can lead to stasis of the fluid in that region for about one to two hours and if it's still wet then it could lead to uh, uh, this, uh, skin necrosis significant uh, skin, uh, skin necrosis which could lead to blistering and skin loss either partial or full thickness so make sure that the padding that you are using, if it is absorbable, then do not use the padding before the uh, the sterilization. 
chemical has dried off completely. Okay, don't pour betadine or alcohol-based solutions into the onto the limb so that it goes and leaks underneath the padding. Okay, in case you're doing that, make sure you put a U drape or a O drape around the limb, and then you can do that so that none of the chemicals are leaking into the cast padding, which is uh, sorry, the tourniquet padding under the tourniquet. Okay, so uh, <coughs> as you know, there are uh, before doing the surgery, before inflating the tourniquet, you need to exsanguinate the limb prior to inflation. That means you need to lift the limb upwards so that all the venous blood which is there drains itself and then you can inflate the tourniquet. But before doing so, you need to be making sure that you are exercising certain precautions. Okay. So, the first precaution you're going to take, okay, is when you do a formal exsanguination. By formal exsanguination, you mean that it is not just a gravity assisted exsanguination. It means that you are taking an S March bandage or any bandage for that matter and you are applying it from distal to proximal so that all the venous drainage or the all the veins